so today is reserved entirely for discussion. And we can continue only as long as may be useful. Uh, but I hope that as many people as possible will speak. And let's begin with a question arising from, from section. Peter? Yeah, the largest question uh, raised by the section in reflecting on the, uh, on the semester was, uh, you, your program seems to say that everything should be up for revision and experimentation, except for one thing, which is the commitment to human agency itself, the commitment to empowering people to have human, to experiment and innovate in the institutions. Why, it, and it seems like that is the one constant in uh, a universe of non-constants. Why did you choose to have that be the constant, and what are the grounds for that being the thing of constant? No, I think there's a, a misunderstanding there, because they're, they're, they're two different subjects. So one subject is the subject of the institutional arrangements, the structure of society. And this, there's no, on my view, on the view that I defended, and that informs the argument, there's no definitive structure. There's no perfect structure. There's no structure of which we can say that it is our home in history and supersedes all further conflict. <coughs> then the second question are the, are the ideas. Uh, the ideas that we bring to political, social, and economic thought. Uh, our understanding of our interests and of our ideals. Uh, those two are revisable. But they don't have the same character as the institutional arrangements. So, uh, it's not appropriate to speak of them in the same way, that is. It's not the same problem of plasticity, of revisability. They're ideas. And ideas are always imperfect and subject to debate. Uh, but we have no way of orienting ourselves in the world without ideas. So we make an argument. Uh, this argument, this particular argument that I've made is an interpretation of what I regard as the most powerful agenda in the world, the agenda of the revolutionary projects of the last two or 300 years in the world. And my view is that this project is simultaneously strong and weak, strong because it is the project to which all other projects in the world respond. Uh, but weak because its, its adepts no longer know what its next step should be on either the political side or, or the personal side. So then the question is, how can we justify a position in these debates about our orientation, uh, in these debates about the fundamental ideas that should guide us? Uh, and uh, all the arguments that we can make for one position against another position are inconclusive. Uh, which is not the same thing as to say that they're arbitrary. So we make arguments, and the arguments are of many different kinds, or stated at many different levels. So in one direction, they refer to a conception of human nature, of humanity, of who we are of our fundamental identity. And in another direction, they refer down to the ground to what we recognize as our most pressing and immediate interests and ideals. But it's a different debate. I think it's a mistake to conflate the debate about institutions, about the arrangements of society, with the debate about ideas. The imperfection of ideas and the way in which we revise them is not the same thing as the problem of the revision of institutions, although there's some kind of loose affinity between these two, between these two subject matters. So uh, uh, in this course, I presented the animating ideas, uh, the ideas about the ideal and the ideas about structure, uh, 
uh, loosely, that is, as the background to concrete programmatic arguments. And I've only sketched the general conception of social theory and the philosophical anthropology, if you like, the conception of humanity that makes sense of these ideas. But of course, they're subject to contest. And uh, as I just said, there are ideas for which the justifications are always inconclusive. So it's a different problem, is, is basically what I'm saying. Who knows? Now, or is that a no, I mean, who knows? I mean, how, how is that different from asking the question of 2,000 years ago, would we subscribe to the, to, to the theory of relativity or cosmos? Presumably, all of our ideas would, would have evolved, would be different, but starting from, starting from where we are. So what can we do? What, we, can, we can form the best ideas we're capable of. Uh, having, uh, and it's preposterous to suppose that our understanding of those ideas, the understanding of humanity of those interests at some remote point in the future would be the same. But there would nevertheless be a, a, a continuity. Uh, now, the continuity can be broken because there are revolutions in the spiritual life of humanity. So these ideas that we now have about uh, our transcendence over context have roots in uh, spiritual context that happened 2,000 years ago uh, in the rise of the world religions. So that was a revolutionary period, a, a, a decisive turn in our understanding of ourselves, of who we really are, that then was manifest in the major world religions that arose in that historical period and that have uh, remained powerful voices in the world ever since. Now, can there be another revolution in the future that would lead to another fundamental transformation in our view of ourselves? Of course. Uh, but uh, if we knew what that revolution could be or should be, we would be undertaking it right now. So, so it's, 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 a, it's a strange question to ask about us. So uh, there, there's no claim in, uh, in, in these ideas that there's somehow the end of our understanding of ourselves. So, so you know, Schopenhauer said of his philosophy, my philosophy is the definitive solution to the enigma of existence. I'm not saying that of, of my ideas. Huh? I think that's, the, I guess, to show the clarification on that I want to yeah. is, um, uh, I think many people who, who put forth philosophy today aspire to some universalism that stands out from the time. So if they find that there's a right to life for free speech or something, they want to think that 5,000 years ago will be down. But well, I think it's there again. There's a confusion uh, in supposing that there's some kind of inevitable slide from the recognition of the historicity of our ideas to then the idea of groundlessness or arbitrariness. It doesn't follow from the acknowledgement that our ideas are contestable and that the arguments for them are inconclusive and that they develop in historical context. It doesn't follow that therefore they're arbitrary and just bets in the dark. We make arguments for them. And these arguments are, are inconclusive and they're made with the materials that we have. But this is, this is the kind of light to which we can aspire. Uh, and then if we say, uh, as a rationalist metaphysics would say, 
the only uh, understanding that would count as light is the one that is super historical, that is eternal, that is proof against contestation, then we're forcing ourselves to conclude that it's just all darkness. So that's, that's not the move I'm making, of course. And, and it should be clear throughout, uh, as I said on the very first day of class, that I'm taking a position in a debate, in a contest. So maybe I should begin our conversation today by restating that view. So my view is that I live, we live, all of us, in a counter-revolutionary interlude in a long revolutionary period in the history of humanity, especially the revolution that uh, the, revolu the, the revolutions that have taken place uh, over the last two or three centuries and that have put the whole world on fire. And uh, I refuse to, to, adapt, to adopt the attitudes and the assumptions that are characteristic of this counter-revolutionary interlude. Those attitudes and assumptions are manifest in institutionally conservative social democracy with its abdication of structural change. And they're manifest as well in the dominant ideas across the whole field of the social sciences and humanities, which naturalize the existing arrangements of society. So I rebel against those attitudes and assumptions and make the arguments, the inconclusive arguments, that motivate and justify my rebellion. Uh, now, then the view that goes with that is this notion that there's this interruption of this revolutionary project. The revolutionary project has two sides. One side is the political side of which has been carried since the 19th century, at least, by the doctrines of democracy, of liberalism, of socialism, with their attack on entrenched social division and hierarchy, uh, and their uh, affirmation of faith in the constructive genius of the ordinary man and woman. And the other side is the personalist side, which is mainly uh, disseminated in the world by uh, romantic culture, the worldwide popular romantic culture, as in popular music or in, or in the soap operas. And this culture, this romantic culture, has a message. The message is the message of the greatness, of the divinity of the ordinary man and woman, that we're not as small as we seem to be. This is the project. And so my view is that this project remains even today, in some deep sense, the dominant project. It's the dominant project because it is the project that has controlled and continues to control the agenda. It's not the only project in the world. It has enemies. And uh, it provokes a response. But all the other projects in the world respond to it, react to it. Now, <coughs> at the same time, uh, I believe that this project, although it remains, in a sense, the dominant project, uh, is, is weak, is weakened. It's weakened because those who subscribe to it, or would subscribe to it, no longer know what its next step should be. And if you don't know what the next steps of a project should be, on the political side or on the moral side, the project begins to disintegrate. A, a, a transformative project in the world can only live, it can only retain its power by being perpetually reimagined and reinvented. And we have, to, we have to let go of it in order to keep it. This is the paradox of life. We, we have to relinquish and, and reinvent 
in order to breathe new life and new meaning. Otherwise, it dies. So then the object of this course is the reinvention of that project on the political side. And I'm equally interested in its reinvention on the moral side, which is then the the discussion of the conduct of life, of the successors to the tangible images that we have of how to live, the romantic image, the image of Christian charity, and so forth, all of which seem to be inadequate or incomplete as guides to how to live today. So that's the attitude. And, and, and then we begin to form ideas and to make arguments and to discover transformative opportunity in this circumstance in which, to go back to Peter's provocation, to my mind, there's an immense distance between saying that a, a position or the arguments for it are inconclusive or incomplete and saying that they're groundless. That's, that's, the, that's the point of departure of, of the effort of the course. Now I'm entirely at your disposal. So uh, uh, we can talk about anything you like. Yes? Um, so regarding like, the corporate bag arguments and advocacy for reforming, is there really any general direction that might be the yes. market of uh, evening democracy? Um, what is the scope of experimentation for like, other countries to, to, to tamper with that vision or next step? Like, should all countries adopt your specific proposals or uh, on like, a more meta point? Well, I'm not sure I understand. So the, the programmatic ideas that we have discussed here, although exemplified in the circumstances of a particular societies, are in principle addressed to the whole world. They're not addressed to the United States uh, uh, any more than any other part of the world. So. Uh, I don't believe in merely national alternatives. So in this position as well, my attitude, the attitude motivating my arguments, is similar to the attitude of the 19th century liberals and socialists. So on one side, I think that even more than in the 19th century, the whole world is united in a chain of analogies of analogous problems, analogous possibilities in the realm of the adjacent possible. It's not true substantively that the alternatives or the solutions for the United States or Germany are radically different than the alternatives and solutions for China or Brazil. Of course, there are variations. But there's a remarkable unity of the problems. And uh, one reason for that is that the point of departure is so restrictive. The point of departure is the very narrow repertory of live options for the organization of different parts of social life that now exist in the world. There's a very narrow repertory for the organization of each part of social life. And that narrow repertory is, in a sense, the fate of the contemporary societies. So the argument is, in one sense, a rebellion against this fate. That's what theory is. Theory is anti-fate. So we think so that we uh, need not have our fate handed down to us. That's, that's the basic attitude. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this is the spirit that is, uh, that is motivating, that is motivating the argument. Yes? Would you put today's elites as corrupted uh, again, uh, against the shared greatness of ordinary men and women? Would you consider them corrupted? Well, what's the, what, let me understand the term corrupted. Corrupted in what sense? So, I, so, of course, uh, 
one of the many dimensions in which this revolutionary project has been becalmed, in which it has stopped, is the dimension of the attack on the class character of society. So the, uh, all of the societies in the world remain class societies. And the default position of the progressives, institutionally conservative social democracy, has proved itself insufficient to overcome class society. So there are fundamental issues, like the issue of the, the status of free labor that so concerned Karl Marx, that remain beyond the horizon of institutionally conservative uh, social democracy. Marx insisted that so long as the dominant form of free labor is economically dependent wage labor, humanity is not free. And we can then expand that discussion, as I've tried to in many different ways. For example, with respect to the question of the relation between the person and the machine. So, so just narrowly on your point, so wh wh what is true is that to the extent that the elites are complicit in the maintenance of this <coughs> regime, that limits the transformative aspirations of humanity to this humanization effort and relinquishes the ambition of structural change, uh, then, they, uh, then, they do, uh, then they do help to perpetuate the belittlement of humanity, as, for example, through the maintenance of class society. So I'm not sure that I would use the word corruption for that, but what I would say is that there is a, a diminishment of the level of transformative ambition. Well, I, I wouldn't, it's, it's, it's an unacceptably moralizing interpretation of the situation. So he's, he's, interpreting, he's, he's interpreting, on your account, uh, populism as, as, a, as a moral condemnation. The pro but the problem is structural. Yeah, the problem is structural, that there's a structure, and that the structure is harmful to everyone. It's, uh, as, as Hegel said, with respect to the dialectic of the master and the slave. The master is the victim as well as the slave. So in this situation, everyone is diminished. And uh, it's not that this doesn't have a moral dimension, is that the, uh, that kind of moralization that is anti-structural is, of course, illusory. It's, it's totally inadequate. And this is... Uh, one of the dimensions of what you could call populism, that populism is a liquefaction of structures without a structural agenda. And so it can be useful uh, in an intermediate step because it liquefies, but liquefaction per se leads nowhere. It doesn't define the next step. Huh? So this is a remarkable feature of the forces that in the name of populism have taken power in some countries, that they have no institutional program. Aside from uh, narrow points such as the containment of immigration, uh, they have no economic program. Their economic program is the rear guard defense of declining mass production. They have no constitutional program. Their program is simply the strengthening of executive authority. They have no proposal for the reorganization of the economy or the state. And the power of a political project is determined by its having an institutional legacy. So in that sense, I'm not sympathetic to 
populism in the way that's being defined because it's non-structural. Yes. 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 can be a deep agenda when it comes, for example, to communist populism, but it's probably not if we look at Viktor Orban. Yes. Um, but that's why I'm asking if you would put yourself into this part, uh, part of uh, thinking uh, that populism isn't necessary to, um, to achieve the aims. That no, no. I think, I think there, there are many ways in which these alternatives could be achieved without passing through the dangerous intermediate step of populism. But in a circumstance such as the circumstance that exists, for example, in the United States, in which the progressives fail to propose a program that would be responsive to the needs, interests, and aspirations of the working class majority of the country, populism is a foreseeable event. So there will be uh, a, uh, a, a, an attempt to respond to these popular interests uh, that has no structural content, that is short-lived, that, has, that lacks an institutional legacy. Uh, and then what could you say? You would say it's dangerous, it may be unfortunate, uh, but it may also be better than nothing at all. That is, it, it creates a liquefaction, a vacuum, which then can be filled. Now, uh, that's not the same thing as having some kind of uh, deterministic historical view that says populism is an inevitable stage in the creation of an alternative. Populism is an accident. And, and, and it's an accident that comes from the absence of a structural alternative. Now, uh, is the absence of a structural alternative predetermined? No. It's, it's the result of a series of political and intellectual failures, especially failures of the social democrats. Yes. The role of geography, so say more. Um, so I'm, I'm reading uh, Julian Brown um, on South of Modern India, and uh, one of the things that, the, one of the arguments that she makes is that she says geography and ecology are crucial in the, historic, uh, the ex historical experience of people, of the people, and the nature of a region's terrain and its productive capacity does yes. much to mold the social organization viable. I mean, geography in the sense of the physical setting of social life? Yeah. Well, it's just an element, of course, because we know from history that we can make almost anything of the physical setting. There's the same physical setting can produce radically different uh, forms of social life. So uh, there, there's no kind of geographical determinism, right? No, no, but not by any deterministic way. So take, take, a, uh, take a classic debate in, in, in history and social theory. Uh, so the, uh, the early 20th century historian, comparative historian and social theorist, uh, Karl Wittfogel, had a theory of oriental despotism. So if there's... Uh, a need to base agriculture in large states on irrigation. Irrigation, according to him, requires a hierarchical structure. And the hierarchical structure required by irrigation then supposedly 
explains the despotic character of the imperial autocratic regimes of a large part of Eurasia in the past. But it's not true, because we know from a fact that the imperative of irrigation can be a practical provocation to the opposite of despotism, which is the organization of complex schemes of horizontal cooperation, as, for example, in the American Southwest, uh, and, uh, or in Israel. Huh? Uh, so the same, the same geographic setting and the same practical challenge can be responded to in radically different ways. So uh, it's like all the other features of our situation, that the, the physical problems or the technological evolution propose the challenge. But they don't limit the response. There are always varied responses. There, there's never a one-to-one -one relation between the physical constraint and the institutional response. Yes? It yes. sounded overly moralistic to me, but your response sounded not moralistic enough in that when you are people or a group of people with power and resources, you can incite structural change. I don't feel that it's merely a lack of imagination or an unreflective entrenchment in your, in your situation mm -hmm. in history. There's something else there. There's a will to maintenance. There's a will of to, course. to keep things the way they are, and that's, that has a moral element. Arguing moral purity, and you are arguing exclusive structural solutions. No, exclusive. So, so uh, the moral quality of life of everyone is shaped in part by the organization of society and of culture. And uh, so, in these class societies, in these societies that have been shaped by the failure to persist in the transformative project, then uh, each one is limited. So the mass of common people are limited by being belittled, by having smaller lives. The, the elites, the property classes, or those in power, uh, then become profiteers. Uh, taking advantage of the situation, and they are perverted in another way. So you're right that these structural situations always have a moral dimension. But uh, there's a big difference between seeing the moral dimension as an aspect of the structural situation and using a moral discourse as an alternative to a structural analysis. Those are two different those are two different things. So, uh, as I mentioned by the allusion to Hegel, uh, everyone is touched by the limitations of the structure. So I think your comment is, 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 is valid that uh, everyone is affected, not just practically in their interests, but morally in in the character of their lives, in the range of their, of their ambitions. And, uh, so I don't disagree with you on that you point. Do you think that there's a connection between moral and structural transformation? Do you think the structural transformation always precedes moral transformation? No, 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 I think that, no, 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 I think that uh, uh, any transformative practice has to appeal not just to self-interest, but to self-respect and to an idea of who we are, of our vocation. And the, the, the deeper the transformation, the harder it becomes to distinguish our practical interests from our moral interests. Because then the debate is, what are the alternatives? And, who do we become under those alternatives? And what are our larger interests? So 
I don't believe that there can be any transformative project that doesn't have a prophetic element. And the prophetic element does appeal to a conception of, of who we are and who we, we can and should become. So it's therefore moral. Uh, and of course, this is one of the uh, one of the many defects of Marxism that in its impatience with the anti-structural moralizing of those who Karl Marx called utopian socialists, uh, it then uh, dismissed or downgraded the moral element in transformation. Uh, but there is a moral element. The, but the crucial point is that the moral element be married to a structural imagination and to the vision of structural alternatives rather than being represented as an alternative to, to a structural project. Yes? As an increase in? So the increase of inclusivity in yes. institutions, um, would you consider that, for example, with regard to women's suffrage or with regard to um, like gay rights or in the institution of marriage? Yes. Um, would you consider that an instance of fragmentary revolution or revolution itself when those institutions become broader and more inclusive? Of course. So change, structural change, is almost always fragmentary. And so this is a deep problem we have that comes to us from the history of social theory, that we tend to associate real change, deep change, with total change. And then any change that is piecemeal, that is stepwise, we dismiss as superficial or reformist. Uh, and. Uh, that contrast denies what is the case, that real structural change in history is almost always fragmentary. And the idea of total change, of revolution in quotes, is just a limiting case, and for the most part just a fantasy. And this piecemeal structural change doesn't happen only in the field of institutions, but in every field of social practices, of assumptions, of culture, it's the same thing, that, that it's fragmentary. Now, one of the characteristics of the fragmentary character of structural change is that we constantly discover in historical experience that an isolated fragmentary change on which we had placed our bets is never enough. And that it is contained or defeated by its failure to be connected with other changes. So, but that isn't an objection to fragmentary change because this insufficiency of the limited change is an opportunity. Because then we, we, we see that change, we see it didn't produce the result that we expected and then that can provoke broadening the field to other changes. So it's not a denunciation of the fragmentary character of change. It's a recognition of its inadequacy. So take the example, the very important and characteristic example uh, related to one of your, your, your remarks of the extension of the suffrage. So I mentioned this. In the 19th century, the, both the conservatives and the leftists, the left liberals, were convinced that the universal suffrage would produce revolutionary results, which some desired and other, others feared. It seems reasonable to have expected that, that in a society of extreme inequality, if you gave everyone the vote, they would use the vote radically to change the economic regime. That's what everyone expected to happen. And it didn't happen. So, so they, they established the universal suffrage 
and the fundamental distribution of property of economic advantage was not changed uh, because there were so many other features of the institutions and of the culture that worked against the use of the vote to produce revolutionary change. But that's not a reason not to establish universal suffrage. That's a reason to discover that universal suffrage all by itself is not enough. So then you, that, so then you, 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 you discover this imbalance, this inadequacy that leads you further. To be able to go from the fragmentary solution to the, to the missing parts, you need a project. You need a structural way of thinking, of understanding how some features of social life connect to other features. And you have to overcome the, the habit of betting on these silver bullets, that there's a single thing that will be the fix. You'll do that, and it will change everything. But that's not how things happen in history. So the, so the, so the two things are, are true at the same time, that the change, change is almost always fragmentary, but there are no silver bullets. And that the, and that the adequacy of any initiative depends on what it's connected with. So in politics, in the political transformation of society, the crucial question always is, and what happens next? Because the meaning of a transformation is determined in large part by its sequel. So it creates an opportunity or imposes a constraint. And the question is, what's the next step? Uh, and uh, all of that may seem obvious, but somehow it's a, it's a combination of attitudes that often escapes us because the dominant ideas in the history of social thought uh, lead us to think in these totalizing ways. Yes? So then how might you differentiate between a local heresy um, and, say, a radical project at the state or municipal level that is intended for replication? Is the difference between the two in... What, you mean intended from, for replication in the world? Yeah. So we can we can make a model that other other cities, other states in the United States might adopt for the sake of a kind of a, a, a bill toward a national transformation. Yes. But you've talked a lot in the beginning of this class about um, local heresies being insufficient. So is the difference between the two that the local project would need to have an explicit dimension of this is how we this is how we upscale it? Well, so, there, so let's, let's imagine two different processions of analogies. So one has to do within a country with the problem of scale. For example, in a federal regime, to what extent are experiments that are done locally applicable to the, not, not just to some other locality in another part of the country, but to a higher level of the federal system? There's no a priori answer to that uh, because the, uh, the central government is not just a scaled up version of the local government. It has powers that the local government lacks, in particular, the power to make the laws and the basic laws, and the laws define the institutions. <coughs> so there are analogies, but incomplete analogies. Now, similarly, then there's the question of to what extent is a transformation produced in one country applicable to other countries? Uh, imperfectly, of course. But to an astonishing degree, yes. Given how the whole world is locked together now in this chain of analogies. So take, for example, the problem that we discussed of the advancement of an inclusive form of the knowledge economy. Uh, countries of the world are radically different. 
Denmark or Finland are not like China or the United States. But a significant advance in the development of the arrangements and practices that established the knowledge economy beyond the insular fringes to which it is now confined would resonate throughout the world. There wouldn't be a mechanical application of what is done in Finland or Denmark to China or the United States. But there would be a pertinence. There would be an application, uh, given this very restricted repertory of problems and solutions that now exist in the world. And that brings me back to another aspect of the answer to your question about uh, uh, local heresy. So in addition to believing that the whole world is united in a chain of analogies and that any significant advance in one part of the world can now resonate sensationally everywhere else, I also believe that there's a practical, a practical objection to the idea of local heresies which is that uh, a, a, a universal orthodoxy cannot be successfully combated by merely local heresies. It's a characteristic position of the contemporary progressives. They say there's a universal orthodoxy labeled neoliberalism or the Washington consensus, and the heresies are local. So it's the Chinese way or it's... Uh, so, and each local heresy is, is composed of the combination of elements of the universal orthodoxy with local adaptations. Uh, that can't work decisively to change the situation in the world. Uh, a universal orthodoxy can be successfully combated only by universalizing heresies. Liberalism and socialism in the 19th century were universalizing heresies. And the programmatic arguments that I've made here in this course, I see as universalizing heresy. That's, that's their spirit. Uh, they can't be mechanically implemented in each country in the world as if they were a universal blueprint. But they do describe a direction and a repertoire of ideas and arrangements that is intended to have broad pertinence to the whole world, uh, or at least to a very wide range of contemporary societies. Yes? So the, the, the remarks about the imagination that I made were just a restatement or an, or an exemplification of the general ideas about humanity, about human nature that inform the argument. So the basic idea of, of humanity is uh, that we are context-bound agents formed in context who transcend their context. So we're located, we're situated, we're not super historical, but uh, no context uh, binds us definitively. So the extreme case would be the savage societies studied by the anthropologists. We imagine a society that has no representation of its own history, in which there's a customary form of life that is perpetuated indefinitely. And then, so that's the extreme case on a spectrum. Say, well, in that society, the person would be uh, a puppet of the structure. 
But no real society is like that. So even then, even in that situation, the individual on this view is capable of causing surprise and of doing something that's beyond the script. So the structure hands to the individual a script. You're a member of such and such a caste, of such and such a culture. Now feel such and such, think such and such, act in such and such a way. That's the script. And your life will be the acting out of the script. Well, there's no human being who is incapable of throwing out the script. That doesn't exist on this view. And uh, so that's, that's, that's a statement about, that's a claim about who we are. And now then, if that view is true, it must be manifest as well in the character of the mind, as well as in all features of our experience. Uh, and so that's this idea that the mind has two sides. The second side of the mind is the side that is not modular and not formulaic, that enjoys the power to combine everything with everything else, which we call recursive infinity, and the faculty of transgressing its own methods and presuppositions, which the poet called negative capability. So we negate before we can affirm. We discover something that our methods and presuppositions will not allow. And then retrospectively, we develop the methods and assumptions that make sense of it. It's that second side of the mind that we call the imagination. And so the claim I'm making is that there is nothing in the physical constitution of the body or of the brain that predetermines the relative force of these two sides of the mind. The relative force of these two sides of the mind is shaped by the organization of culture and of society and of education. And in that sense, the history of politics, the history of politics is internal to the history of the mind. That's the view. So now then there's the faculty of the imagination. So Immanuel Kant said that the decisive move of the imagination is distancing from the phenomenon. So the image is a memory of a perception. To have an image, we must not be perceiving. We must remember the perception. We must be distant from it. That's the first move of the imagination. And the second move of the imagination, which Kant did not explore, is that we subsume the phenomenon under a range of transformative variation. We, we, we understand the phenomenon by designing around it a penumbra, a periphery of transformative possibility. We say, it could become this other thing, given certain circumstances or provocations. That's how we understand anything in science. We understand it by grasping its transformative possibilities under certain conditions. If we don't imagine it transformatively, we don't understand it. We don't understand, we just stare at it. And that, so the, the, this is the deep character of the imagination. So, one way of, of, of grasping uh, these programmatic ideas, one of the many dimensions in which you could understand their general character, is they deal with the question of, uh, given our present circumstances in history, the institutional ideas and arrangements that are our points of departure, how do we create a society that is suitable to a creature that has imagination uh, and that is capable of developing this second side of the mind and manifesting it in, in the practical organization of society. Uh, now, uh, 
I'll make a comment, if I may be forgiven, a, a, an autobiographical comment, but may, may help uh, in the interpretation of some of these ideas. So uh, in this counter-revolutionary interlude, uh, I belong to a relatively early moment, which was the so-called generation of 1968, in which there were a series of rebellions all over the world. And its most characteristic slogan was the slogan, imagination in power. So this was generally derided by the realists and disillusioned who have since commanded the world as an empty romanticism. And uh, it has taken me a very long time to try and give content to what seemed to be the empty romantic slogan. Uh, but th th this is a way of, of interpreting it, that, that, the, that the Marxist impulse to say, history is our salvation. It has a pro We don't need a project, because history will provide the project. So there's a script. We'll enact it. So it's not like the Indian children who get the script from the closed society, but it's history. Hegel, Marx, they help, they, history has a slogan, has, has a script, and will enact the script. But history doesn't have a script. And this was a lie, an illusion. Huh? Uh, and so everything begins when we discover that there is no script, there's no necessary script. To the extent that there is a script, which is the inertial force of the past, of path dependency, the script is no good. We should throw it out. We should do what I recommend to the young Indian child, throw it out. Uh, and that then is associated with this supposedly empty romantic slogan, imagination and power. So that's a very simple way psychologically of uh, explaining the fundamental impulse in these in these programmatic arguments. Yes? My understanding is that experiments like, say, see what drives the human learning, like the discovery of human imagination and possibility. Experiments by? By states or? By states, you mean nation states? Yeah. Yes. So what exactly then is the question? Is the question whether <coughs> starting from certain premises, from certain assumptions, we can ever get out of those premises? Or is, is that the question? So there's never a closed circle, right? I mean, let, let's begin with, this, with the prior question of path dependency. So. There is a powerful element of path dependency in our historical experience. Path dependency means that what happens later is shaped by what happened before. And so uh, this is a respect in which social theory is analogous to, to, to natural history. So. Uh, what are the dominant features of the natural historical way of thinking about the world, about evolution, for example? So first, uh, <coughs> the influence of path dependency. Experience is shaped by these loosely connected causal sequences. Second, that there is no immutable taxonomy of fundamental elements of nature. 
everything that is real changes. Now, this is in total opposition to the dominant philosophical project in the West, which is the Greek philosophy of being. So on, on this view, there's a permanent set of, cons of ultimate constituents of nature, of types of being, and of regularities that govern these types. And this permanent repertory, this permanent taxonomy, and the regularities that govern it are outside of time. That's the Greek philosophy of being, which is reinvented in the dominant strand of modern science, fundamental physics, from, from Newton to quantum mechanics and relativity. But in natural history, we think a different way. We think that there is no immutable taxonomy of types of being, that everything that is real changes sooner or later. And therefore, and this is the crucial move, we dissociate the criterion of reality from the criterion of immutability. The real is not immutable because there is nothing immutable. Everything that is real is mutable. And then comes the third characteristic of the natural historical way of thinking, which is that insofar as there are regularities, the regularities evolve together with the phenomena. So for example, uh, the rules of Mendelian genetics are not prior to the evolution of life, unless we make a metaphysical assumption that they were somehow waiting off stage for a cue to come onto the stage of reality. Uh, now, uh, in the historical experience of humanity, we add something to these features of the natural historical way of understanding. And one of the things that we add, which is very closely related to our imaginative character and our powers of transcendence, is that path dependency is a variable, not a constant. That is, in the organization of society and in the history of society, the extent to which the past shapes the present and the future is itself an object of contest. And we can form the ambition to create institutions and forms of culture that undermine the power of the past over the future. Now, this is a very important point. It's a very important point because it's related to another major assumption in the programmatic arguments of the course. Remember, I said, uh, like the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we have reason to recognize <coughs> the importance and indeed the primacy of structural change, change in the fundamental institutions. And this is the sin of conservative social democracy, its abdication of the agenda of structural change. But unlike the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we cannot bring ourselves to believe in the definitive adequacy of any dogmatic institutional blueprint. So we can formulate directions, but not a blueprint. And so therefore, one of the most important attributes of any set of institutional arrangements in the organization of the economy and in the organization of politics, of democracy, is that they facilitate their own transformation, that they make it possible and easier for us to correct them in the light of experience. <coughs> so that idea is related to the conception, for example, 
that the market economy should not be fastened to a single version of itself. There should be alternative regimes of property and contract, alternative ways to decentralize economic initiative, coexisting experimentally within the same economic order. Similarly, it's related to the, to the uh, idea of the dissemination of the knowledge economy. Because what's the most advanced practice of production? It's the practice of production that's closest to the imagination. And the closer it is to the imagination, the, the, the less it makes the future depend on the past. So one of the most fundamental regularities in economic life and the regularity that has the greatest claim to be considered a law in economics, if any law, if anything is, is declining returns to marginal productivity. So you have increased the inputs for the production of a good or service, and after a while, it will produce declining returns. If there's any regularity in economic life that deserves to be called a law, that's it. But now it seems that the knowledge economy holds the potential to suspend this law or even to reverse it, uh, to relax the constraint of diminishing returns, or even to create the possibility of increasing returns. And that would be a revolution in, ec in an economic life, if anything would. Now, those are all examples of the diminishment of path dependency in economic life. And in political life, the conception of a high energy democracy is a, is a conception of, of a democracy that allows us not to wait for crisis in order to make change possible and uh, overthrows the rule of the, of the living by the dead, diminishing the power of path dependency. Uh, so, so let's take another analogy um, to science. So you know this conception in the history of science of the contrast between, as in Thomas Kuhn's work, between revolutionary science and normal science. So normal science works within a paradigm. And then from time to time, there's a revolution, like Newton or Einstein. The paradigm is broken. So if the scientist is working within the paradigm, it's as if the great dead were controlling his agenda. That's path dependency in science. He's acting according to instructions. And then the genius comes along and breaks the paradigm. But uh, a higher form of scientific practice would be one in which normal science acquired some of the attributes of revolutionary science. That is, this would be the diffusion of, quote, genius in, in, in the work of science. Now, again, going back to the programmatic arguments in the course, they have the same character that uh, instead of there being rare systemic transformations, there is this facility for perpetual structural change, which is the equivalent to the situation in which normal science takes on characteristics of revolutionary science. And then path dependency is weakened the power of the past over the future, we become more powerful. We acquire agency. We're not then in the grip of the past in the same way. So the idea is that this interest of ours is connected to our most fundamental moral and material interest. It's connected to our material interest in the development of our powers of production and it's connected to our moral interest in the supersession 
of entrenched social division and hierarchy. In other words, that the institutions that have this character of laying themselves open to revision will also have the character of helping to undermine the structures of class society and of developing our powers of production as through the idea of a disseminated form of the knowledge economy. So all of that, all of those arguments, you could bring under the heading of the imagination in power. It's the vindication of the belated vindication of 1968. Yes? So I understand why we need to reject uh, past dependency, but what does this book say about the value of history in general? I think you mean the value of studying history? Yes. The rich did it in the past, and we continue to do it today. And I guess even if we reject that there are rules in science and thought that transcend time, or that specific characteristics of human nature transcend time themselves, there's, there are some notions, let's say inequality, war, peace, that do transcend time, and they do cure based on some causal relationship with each other. So learning from history may absolutely in a better future. Absolutely. Absolutely. So none, none of this discourse is an argument against the study of history. So, I mean, look, for example, at the arguments we had about the United States uh, and the, the, the immediate genealogy of the progressive project in the United States. So uh, the problem is the progressives in the United States failed to develop a sequel to Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. So that's the American equivalent to the European problem of the sequel to institutionally conservative social democracy. The liberalization of social democracy is not a sufficient sequel in the attempt to solve the structural problems. So, but then it's crucial to understand what the New Deal really was. Example of the importance of studying history, what it accomplished and what it didn't accomplish. So then the progressives discover, well, they didn't do what Franklin Roosevelt did. So then they begin to sentimentalize the New Deal. We just have to imitate Franklin Roosevelt. But they have to study what the New Deal really was to understand that they can't just imitate. They have to learn from it. So the early institutional experimentalism of the New Deal was narrowly focused on a corporatist restabilization of the American economy. And not on the democratization of economic opportunities and capabilities. And then in the immediate following period, the focus was narrowed to the provision of antidotes to economic insecurity, as through social security. But antidotes to economic insecurity mean something very different depending on whether they are combined or not combined with arrangements that sustain economic empowerment, <laughs> agency in the economy. So it's a negative lesson that we learned from the study of the New Deal. It did produce structural change, but the structural change that it produced is not the model for the change that is needed today. Then we go further and we study the remarkable episode of the war economy, which is like a black box in American history. The Americans don't understand what happened in the war economy. There was a massive mobilization of resources. This is a country in which was supposedly devoted to the sacrosanct free market ideology. And when it needed to, it cast it off as if it were just a superficial mask, in which they never really believed in that. Then they did everything the opposite in four years. 
And during those four years in which they did everything the opposite, they doubled GDP in those four years. Uh, and the ability to cooperate. So a tremendous amount to learn from that. So what, what was the crucial element in the experience of the war economy? It was the combination of massive mobilization of resources with bold institutional experimentation, never completely formalized and quarantined because seen as not relevant to the organization of the peacetime economy. So these are all examples of, of, of what we can learn only by studying history. That is, it, it, it is only by understanding what happened that we can then have this inspiration for the development of the alternatives today. So, uh, so in turning against path dependency and acting according to the principle uh, of the Gospels, let the dead bury the dead, uh, we, uh, we have reason, nevertheless, uh, to, to know even more what happened. What happened so that we, so that we won't be dominated by it. Huh? Uh, so, so I agree entirely with your, with your recommendation. Now, uh, it seems to me that I also have a right to ask a question. And, uh, and so a general question I wanted to ask you is, what advice you have for me uh, in the uh, uh, in the development of this intellectual project and of the the political and moral projects which is which with which it is associated? Well, that's secondary, isn't it? I mean. Uh, so, uh, you know, th there's an inherent limitation in this situation here of this school. Uh, and uh, because there's no context, there's no sequel. So there, there are several limitations. One limitation is this uh, formula of two-hour classes over 12 weeks. So these are subjects that go in every direction. So the ideal is that you could begin a discussion and pursue it over many, many hours, not in two hours, and pursue it in every direction. But the fundamental requisite for that would be limitless patience. So we have to be willing. Huh? So that's the first, that's the, that's, that's the initial constraint. Then, and, uh, then there's this other more fundamental constraint of the absence of a, a, a context. Because in our ideas about humanity and about society, the test is then in, in some form of enactment. We, we have ideas, and, and we then go out and do something. Uh, we do something together, and then we fight with each other, and we split into different factions, and there's a different dialectic and so forth. Uh, but that's not the situation here. So today, the course ends, and we all go our separate ways, and then uh, it fades. Huh? So uh, that's, that's built into the situation. Huh? So my advice would be to, have, to find protégés whose planned work is going to reach into the economic, legal, and political arrangements. Uh, well, it seems like a dangerous advice because, of course, this is a, a characteristic of the professors. Uh, they like to have followers, right? Uh, but I'm not sure that the following of the doctrine is the way. So, so there, there, there are two, there, just to clarify, there are two sets of problems, right? So one is 
one set of problems has to do with the development of the ideas. What's the best way to develop these ideas? So it seems they have to be developed in general, as general ideas about society and history, as Karl Marx did. And then they have to be developed engaged in interventions in particular contexts, historical context, political context, has to be engaged with the real contest in particular societies. And uh, of course, there's, there's a problem, because uh, given the, the division of knowledge into these disciplines, it's not enough to float above as general social theory. It's necessary to invade the territory of each of the specific disciplines, and especially of the most important disciplines, the most influential disciplines of the institutional imagination, which are economics and law. Uh, and no one knows how to do that because every little part of that enterprise is a lifetime. So it seems there has to be some division of labor. And then there's the second set of problems, which has to do with the, the relation between thought and practice. So again, Hegel's remark. The last remaining tragedy in the bourgeois world is the impossibility of combining a life of thought with a life of action. Uh, but maybe too pessimistic, right? Because uh, we can't do them at the same time. But we might do them in the course of a lifetime if we're lucky. Uh, so these are the two activities, philosophy and politics, which seem to be most appealing, most worthy of a human being. If by philosophy we mean thought in its most ambitious form, and politics, transformative politics. The reason why they're so appealing is, is the same reason why they're so hard to combine, which is that they're not about anything in particular. They're about everything. And second, that not only are they about everything, but they demand everything. They demand a complete mobilization of the emotions. And this is what makes them so hard to combine. But to combine in the sense of doing at the same time. But maybe we could do them in succession. But the ability to do them in succession depends on luck. Uh, and not just on virtue. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure huh? what, what they, uh, how to proceed. Then another remark that I'd make is that it's important for this kind of intellectual practice to exist in a form that is not just comprehensive. Because if it exists only in its comprehensive form, then maybe only very few people can do it. So it has to exist also in a form that's fragmentary. Like I said, structural change in politics is fragmentary. Uh, and, but it can be deep and fragmentary at the same time. So it can be a collective practice in which many can share. And I think this is a defect of the kind of argument that I presented here, that I haven't presented it in a way that suggests how it can be transformed into a collective practice. And that's how I would formulate your idea about the protégés in a form more acceptable, to me at least. It's not about having protégés. It's about having a project that is open to many in many different ways. 
Uh, yes. Well, you know there exists a socialist yeah, international, and it's no good. Yes, I'm not yes. talking about the decayed uh, body, yeah. which, uh, which calls itself that name today. Yes. I'm talking about uh, to find some international intellectual counterparts which are interested on another perspective. <coughs> the same values, but can, can be like, yeah. say, like done. Globalization, and it's very open to talk about uh, innovation of this kind. Uh, and I think, like Danny, there's a lot of people, uh, not a lot, uh, maybe a handful, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, that, that are really, from the intellectual point of view, they really stand out in, in their uh, willingness to, to, to talk about a new path. And I think if there would be some guardians of that file who will not be uh, stationed in a university or an establishment which is, uh, <coughs> as, you, as you said, is very uh, 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 restrained from, that, from the, uh, the institutional way. And they will talk about contemporary issues and they will try to be effective in the way the things that the, the thing that they will comment about, the, the, the critical thinking that they will write together, <coughs> they will fight about, will be something that will, will be entangled with the, the work of organizing people in parties, like in the way that Marx and Engels work, worked. From the, from the one point of view, when something happened in Russia, they could have written about it. In Paris, they could have, they were the, the most uh, innovative thought, and really, if I can say, true thought about what was happening in the political regimes in the world was written at that time by those guys. Yes. Because they, they said, before Lenin came, they said, this is what will happen in Russia. There is a chance to do that in Russia. They talked about Germany. They talk, and they tried to take part in some of the, uh, uh, of the political processes that they saw as revolutionary, uh, uh, revolutionary in that way. Like now we, you are very entangled in the process in Brazil. We saw what happened with Lula. It's very heartbreaking to see that. And, and maybe it closes the door for what is happening in Brazil for, for, uh, for, uh, for you more, but for me too. Because I, I was expecting to see what will happen there. And I think there are more places in the world uh, uh, that are really, uh, there is this discussion. Let's, let's look about what is happening in Germany now when the Deutsche Bank, who made uh, what he made to the south of Europe, is now entangled in his own doing on the, what is uh, being tried in the continent by some parties which are uh, not uh, populist ones, which ones that are yes. about to take uh, another step. What is Mahafad is trying to do with DM25? I don't know if, if it's really uh, taking shape, but something like that can open the minds of our yes. establishments in the world. So, so we have. So, so let me let me take off from the example you gave of 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 Karl Marx, of your allusion to Karl Marx in the 19th century. So, there are three features of the experience of Marx and his. Uh, followers and allies, which we can't reproduce and we shouldn't want to reproduce. But it's uh, a good provocation to, to thinking about what we need to do or can do. So first there's the issue of world politics. Transformative politics should not be just national. It should be world politics. It should have a world project. Uh, as I said, it's not a, a local heresy, it's a universalizing heresy. But they had a structure. 
the Communist International, the, the movement. Uh, we don't have the equivalent instruments uh, which we would have to form. Uh, and then comes the second problem, which it was easier for them to have this international structure because they had a dogma, an institutional dogma, so which could be codified, which could be given a canonical form. And uh, it's much harder to have a movement when we acknowledge at the outset that there is no canonical form. There's only a direction and an open repertory of institutional ideas and, and possibilities. Then comes the third aspect of their experience, which is psychologically and morally very interesting. So their ideas were deterministic ideas. History has a project. And how are we to understand this, not just epistemologically or methodologically, but psychologically? So it's as if they, they confronted overwhelming odds. What they desired was improbable. It was the path of least resistance. And this historical fatalism could be interpreted in one sense as an effort to arouse the heroic will against the overwhelming odds on the basis of an illusion. So we seem to be very weak, but we're not as weak as we seem to be because history is on our side. We have an ally. Uh, and then there was this psychological function of motivating the will to resistance. So now we give ourselves this task of cultivating the will to resistance without relying on this illusion. And that's very hard. Uh, that requires the marriage of hope to the imagination. Well, uh, I'm immensely grateful to you for this opportunity. Uh, and I just wish they would go on forever. Thank you very much.
Kann ich gar nicht sagen. Ich habe eine Idee, wo man kann. 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 Ich habe eine Idee, wo man kann.